Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us here today. My name is Katie Earl. I'm the coordinator of the University Express program, and we're here with Joanne Folletta from the Buffalo Philharmonic Orchestra. Welcome, Joanne. Well, thank you, Katie. I'm delighted. I've been looking forward to this, and uh, um, I, I know there may be some friends out there, and I say hello to everyone who came to be part of this with us, and uh, thank you for welcoming me. Absolutely. We're so appreciative of your time and to everyone who's here with us today. Thank you. And I just quickly thank the sponsors of our program, which is our Department of Senior Services, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Western New York, Celsius Orthopedics and Wegmans for their support. And as always, don't hesitate to call us at Senior Services. We're at 858-8526. And as Joanne and I go through her talk today about her journey with the BPO and everything through music, Please write in your questions and comments to our Q&A panel. I'll be monitoring that and I'll be sure to ask as many as we have time for. So if you're new to us today, your Q&A panel is on your lower right hand side of your screen. Just click that, send your questions to me. And if you're on a tablet, poke your screen. That'll bring up your control panel and you'll be able to access your Q&A that way. Um, Joanne, before we jump in, do I sound okay to you? Absolutely, you're very clear to me. All right, thank you. So, if we may get started, the first question I'll pose to you is what inspired you to pursue music as a career? Well, I have to thank my parents for that, Katie, because um, I think they noticed that I liked music when I was a very young child. They must have, because I know that on my seventh birthday, to my great surprise, I opened up a box and in it was this beautiful little guitar that they had gotten me, a classical guitar. I hadn't asked for it. I, I wasn't even sure, you know, how, how to approach a guitar, but they had also made, my father had made arrangements for a lesson the very next day, the day after my birthday. So my guitar teacher came to our apartment, our, our little apartment in Queens, New York, and I had my first lesson. And you know, that was the beginning of my voyage in music. I, I think that how, however my parents knew this, it was exactly the right thing for me. It was the right adventure. It was the right world because I fell in love with that guitar. I remember thinking that it was so beautiful and the wood had a beautiful fragrance that just enchanted me and touching the strings felt so special. And I'd spent a long time just playing the open strings, you know, which is kind of, which is kind of boring, but, but, um, uh, but I loved it. I mean, and so that was the beginning. And I, I studied, I stayed with guitar all my life, and, but I studied other instruments. And then around the age of 10 or so, I started to go to concerts with my parents and I fell in love with the orchestra. I didn't fall out of love with the guitar. I still loved it and, I, and it was the center of my life. But the idea of an orchestra making music, and I'm hoping that maybe, uh, some of the people out there feel the same way. When you hear an orchestra warming up, you hear them start to play, I thought it was the most amazing sound in the world. And I said to my father, I want to be a conductor. So that's how it started. <laughs> but that's the very beginning. It was a long journey then. <laughs> I'd love to hear more about that journey. So you, but you knew from a very young age where you wanted to end up. I did, and you know, it's kind of funny too, Katie, because I wonder why I didn't say, I want to play the violin, or I want to be the concert master, or I want to be the principal oboe. I said, I want to be the conductor, because for some reason, the conductor gave me a feeling that that person, and in this case, this concert that I'm thinking of right now was Leopold Stokowski, the great Leopold Stokowski at Carnegie Hall. He seemed to be sort of enabling everybody even though he wasn't playing an instrument, he seemed to be kind of like establishing this magical landscape where all of this great sound was coming from. So I thought if I could be in the middle of that. Now, my parents were not musicians. They weren't professional musicians. So they, uh, they didn't know. They didn't know how do you start studying conducting. But I told my guitar teacher and he helped me. He was teaching me theory and ear training and, and um and when I was 18 years old, I became a double major at the Manus College of Music in New York, guitar and orchestral conducting. So um, it was a dream that just came about because of my amazement from, you know, listening to this music. You know, and at the age of 10 or 11, Katie, I don't think I could have described how I felt, but I knew 
that I walked out of that hall and I felt somehow like I was floating. And um, I think that's what music do, did to me and does to a lot of people. So anyway, then the whole journey took me all, all over the all over the country. And and um, and I can't believe it's 21 years in Buffalo, 21 years. Um, it seems like I just came here yesterday, but it's been a very, very happy 21 years. And the orchestra is wonderful. But, you know, the region, the community of Buffalo and Erie County has been amazing, amazing place to be an artist and to work and to share music with people. Wow, 21 years. I know, I can't believe it. <laughs> That's amazing, and several Grammys. Yes, the orchestra uh, has one more. They just won a recent one that was very important for a big piece we did, a big piece for chorus and orchestra, um, written by my friend Richard Daniel Poor, and that was really thrilling. But um, uh, yeah, winning a Grammy is very, very scary and very exciting. So, but th in this case, the Grammy was for so many people. It was for our entire orchestra, and it was for our entire chorus, the Buffalo Philharmonic Chorus. So that's a lot of people, and uh, and for our chorus master Adam Lukey, who um, led the chorus in the preparations for for our recordings. So it was a very happy day when we heard that. I know I lost your I lost your sound. Oh, oh I was muted. Okay. Um, I was gonna say just the excitement and knowing how much work goes into that to feel that sense of accomplishment. Wow. It does. But you know when we're doing it, uh, when we're rehearsing and we rehearse he, they rehearse every week and we're rehearsing all week long, it doesn't feel like work. It just feels like we're a family doing something incredible together. And I guess that that's what the team of an orchestra is. It's really it's not like work, it's like life for us. So I'm very lucky to be in the middle of that. So what does a typical day as a conductor look like? Well, I could tell you about a sort of a week because we, we always have our concerts on the weekend um, and we rehearse all week. Musicians in the Buffalo Philharmonic and most orchestras in our country have one day a week off and that's Monday. That <laughs> sounds like an odd day, but Monday is always off. Uh, although many of our musicians use that day to teach. They either go down to Fredonia or to UB or, or teach privately on that day, but that's their day off. And then starting Tuesday morning, we start to rehearse and we rehearse Tuesday through Friday or Tuesday through Thursday and then give concerts on the weekend. So it's very intense because the musicians have to prepare the music beforehand because we only have three days to get it all together. And some of the music is very difficult. So. Uh, and then we start it all over again the next week. <laughs> so it's it's just great. I mean, it's 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 a beautiful place. Imagine being in the middle of something so beautiful every day. And we are every day we're playing another piece, and then a second piece is beautiful pieces, beautiful, beautiful guest artists who come to us and play. So um, it's really it's it's very intense and a lot of work, and everyone has to practice very hard. But um, it's it's a wonderful way to live your life in the middle of something beautiful. It sounds really magical. It is magic. I really think it is magic. <laughs> now, how do you go about selecting the music for the season? Well, I tr it's a little like a jigsaw puzzle, I think. I try and get a good mix of everything because we have music for orchestra we have from the 1700s up through today. I mean, so we try and get a mix of all of that uh, and not all at once, but, you know, a, a piece from the distant past, a piece that's very current and try and put them together. And it's a little bit like preparing a menu, Katie, if you can imagine where you want all the pieces to complement each other. So the three or four pieces on the program, they should make each other look good. You know, they, they, they're a complementary, almost as if they're having a conversation with each other. And when the audience leaves at the end of the two-hour concert, hopefully they feel that, oh, those three pieces or those four pieces made sense. And, and it gave them some idea of a time or a concept or, or simply the beauty of the music they heard. So, uh, so that's how we put them together. And we always have so many more that we want to play that we have to say, okay, next season we'll get them on. The season after that, we couldn't fit them on. We try and get things from different backgrounds, you know, whether it's Italian or German or American or South American, French. We try and mix that up. And again, from different time periods, too. So.
And I imagine you draw a lot of inspiration from your stints being a guest conductor internationally and nationally. I do because you know when I when I go out oh, uh, I leave Buffalo to be a guest conductor wherever I learn a lot because it's a different orchestra. Every orchestra has their own personality, their own sound. So when I'm in a different city, there are things that I hear or that I pick up that hopefully I bring back to Buffalo. So I've learned about pieces, different pieces. When I was working in, in um, Belfast, Northern Ireland, I learned a lot about Irish and English music that I didn't normally do in the US. You know, we didn't do all the pieces I did over there and I brought them back here and we've, we've done some of them. So yeah, you know, it does teach you a lot when you, uh, when you guest conduct. And in a way it's, it's a different experience because when you're music director, as you can imagine, you are responsible for everything artistic that happens. You have to pick the pieces. Of course, you have to pick the soloists. You have to worry about marketing. You have to worry about development and work with the executive director and finances and all. But when you go as a guest conductor, you're only there for a week and you have no worries at all. You don't have to worry about any of that. You just make music with the orchestra. So it's like being on a fun date and not have to worry about the long term, just that fun date. So. Um, but I do learn a lot and I enjoy it. That's pretty funny. <laughs> um, so what's it like dealing with different personalities and different temperaments of the musicians and everybody that's part of the team? This is a very good question because, you know, the team of, a, of an orchestra, I think, is the most highly trained team in the world because you have to realize that all of our musicians started studying violin or cello or, or flute when they were really young. I mean, in the case of string players, probably three or four years old. I think Nicky, our concertmaster, started at four, I think he said, or maybe even before. So these are people who've been studying literally all their lives to perfect that one instrument, to be great on that one, one instrument. And, uh, and the people who win jobs in an orchestra, like the Buffalo Philharmonic, are the people who are really at the top. So you could understand that maybe they'd never thought when they were young about being in an orchestra. Maybe they wanted to be a great soloist, like a Joshua Bell or a Yo-Yo Ma. That's what they were thinking of, being a great soloist, because they, were, they are great. But not everyone winds up being a great soloist, so many of them say, oh, you know, it might be fun to be in an orchestra like the Buffalo Philharmonic. So they come to the Buffalo Philharmonic but they're still playing like a soloist and they're still playing on the highest level. And I think you'll understand this and the listeners will, they still have that ego of a soloist. Now I'm saying ego in a good way. It's not ego in a bad way, but ego in a way that it enables them to work hard and to search and strive for perfection and to care about what they sound like. So, so I have all of these superstars around me and you have 80 people all of whom are soloistic types and have their own strong feelings about music. And the conductor is the one who somehow has to get all of that to coalesce, you know, to get all of that incredible talent to sort of be on the same page. So it's, but other people who lead groups, I think will probably tell you the same thing. You know, the, the more talented the group is, the more exciting it is, but sometimes the more difficult it is to sort of, you know, get everyone to agree. Um, and musicians do learn that when they're in an orchestra, that since there are 80 to 100 people on the stage, you can't really have much discussion about things. You'd never get anything done. I mean, you'd have to rehearse for three months to get something done. So they know that the conductor is the one who's responsible for a lot of the decisions. But the way I think about conducting is that I like to sort of let the musicians inform what's going on so that when they play Beethoven Fifth, it's theirs, you know, it's how they feel about it. it. It's how, it's their personality. So that's what makes it exciting to let them have freedom to do that. So, so it's psychological to being a conductor, not only knowing the music and knowing how to make things better and what to ask for, but also to appreciate the incredible gifts of the musicians around you. Yeah. And what motivates people and you're talking about yeah organizing everybody and all those small interpersonal communication things that you have to be on exactly you're so right you you get it you know sometimes i tell people because it with music it's kind of hard to understand but a, a director of a play is, is sort of 
equivalent to my job as a conductor. The director comes in, let's say it's Hamlet, and he or she has a strong idea about, okay, this is how I want it, and this is my vision of Hamlet, and this is, you know, this is how I'd like it to develop, and this is how, how I'm thinking of it. And then he has maybe, you know, eight or 10 uh, actors there, and they're all really talented. And they all have their strong idea about what Hamlet is like. Like Hamlet really, the, the man playing Hamlet knows what, how he wants to project Hamlet and so on. Ophelia knows how she wants to portray Ophelia. So the director of the play has to say, okay, I, I have to honor that. I mean, I have to enjoy that. I have to incorporate that. And so she or he is able to bring all of those people together uh, with their concepts and their ideas to create a Hamlet that makes sense for everybody. So it's a very similar role. The only difference is I have to stay on the stage because the musicians are following me. They can't really hear each other well enough to play by themselves. The stage is too big and too much sound. The director, of course, is in the audience then. But the concept is the same. You have a concept of what this piece of art is about, and then you use everyone's talents to make it everybody's, everybody's uh, project, you know, so. Um, and it's and it's really very thrilling, and and you get to know the musicians really well. I'm sure, and that has to be such a satisfying moment, being up there and seeing everybody playing and, and living in that moment and doing their job. Wow. It is. I mean, the, the rehearsals are tremendous fun to have us all working together. But then the concerts when we have an audience, you know, I'll talk about that in a moment, when we have an audience, that's when I think everyone really comes alive because our, our audience is there and they are part of what's happening. You know, sometimes audiences think, oh, well, we're just sitting here. You know, we're, we're not doing anything. We're kind of passive and we can just relax. Well, I hope they do relax, but the thing is they're really not a passive player because we are very aware of them. We can see them leaning forward. We know how they're breathing. We can sense if it's like super quiet, Katie, that they're really listening. So the, we're reacting to them all the time. And audiences are really important. And we've missed our audiences, you know, for the period from September 2020 to um, April 2021, we didn't have any audiences. We were playing just ourselves. And now we're opening up the hall and we're so excited. We have small audiences. We've only had up to 200 so far, but, but it's going to grow and grow. So now we feel like we're getting to be complete again because our audience is there. I'm so glad that you brought that up because I wouldn't think that you would be that in tune with the audience. I think that you'd be so, and you meaning anyone in the orchestra, so focused on what you're playing that you may not hear or notice anybody else. Well, the musicians absolutely do notice them. I intuit it because I don't see them, but I can hear what they're, how they're breathing and, and you can almost sense people leaning forward. But the musicians can actually see them all. And there's something very special about Klein Hands and those people who've been in Klein Hands, most of the people listening have been in Klein Hands, know that we don't have a proscenium. Some orchestras play behind a proscenium. You know, it's a very kind of structured thing and we're on the stage and they're in the house and there's like this wall between us, this invisible wall. Klein Hands is not like that. Klein Hands is like, we're all in the same space. The stage kind of swoops out and the audience is there around us, you know, where they're kind of like putting their arms uh, close to the stage around us. So there's a very close relationship between the orchestra and the audience. And, and our musicians actually look for people. They know where people sit. They have their friends and their neighbors who come. And it's, it's a beautiful relationship. And I think we have Klein Hands to thank partly for that because the hall encourages a real closeness between the musicians and the, and, the, and the audience. Even if you're sitting in the last row, you don't feel very far away from, from the musicians and they don't feel far away from you. So it's, um, I, the musicians play really for their audience. You can see them, their energy, their enthusiasm, because they know there are people sitting just a few yards from them listening. Wow, that is wonderful. It's, it's a great feeling. It's a great feeling. I hope our audience feels that. I think they do feel the energy of the musicians because they're very aware of the musicians that the audience is there. 
I think they do. And I'm just looking at all of these questions that are coming through now. So let's just pick out a couple here, if that's okay. Sure. Um, one of them is, what is your favorite large work to perform? Oh, that's hard to say, but I, I guess, because I, lo I love doing, I love doing everything, even the small pieces, but um, I guess uh, this is, you know, as a musician, as a conductor, conducting a Mahler symphony is always very special to me. You know, the idea that, um, um, uh, you know, we might have with the chorus 200 or plus people on the stage and they're all singing and playing in the same way. Um, like a Mahler second symphony, which we were supposed to do and we had to cancel it because of the, you know, too, too big to play, but we'll get it on uh, very soon. Um, you know, everyone is singing about what heaven is like and at the end of our lives, we'll go to heaven and wow, to be in the middle of that. Katie, I can't tell you what that feels like. I mean, when, when everyone is singing, what Mahler believed that, that after life, you know, there's something great waiting for us. And uh, it's just a tremendous experience. So I would have to say Mahler Resurrection Symphony, which is what it's called. I have to pick one, but Beethoven 9 is also a very, very special one. We'll do that one too soon, we hope. Wow. And so when you're guest conducting, do you get to give a, a request for something you'd love to conduct? Okay. Usually, uh, usually they'll ask me for some suggestions. And then the music director of the orchestra that was inviting me um, uh, will take a look at them and then he or she will say, oh no, we did this last year, we better not do it so soon. Or, oh, we haven't done this one for a while. This is a great choice, let's do this. So uh, it's usually a kind of back and forth. And, um, and uh, uh, next week I'm going to Portland, Maine to conduct their orchestra. And I'm actually doing a smaller Mahler Symphony, Mahler Symphony number no. four, which is beautiful. And, and the music director and I agreed that would be a good thing to do at this time when it's, the world is opening up again. And that's what that piece is about. So um, I'm looking forward to that. That will be exciting. It will be. So we have a, a question and comment. I've really enjoyed the excellent on-demand concerts. You've done a marvelous job. Will these be offered in some format once live audiences are back? It would be so beneficial for the elderly and homebound. Thank you very much. And, and that person is right. I mean, we, we discovered a new world um, starting when, yeah, starting in September when we started to, to film our concerts without an audience. And we realized that people really did enjoy them uh, listening from home. So uh, I wanna thank that person for listening. Thank you, because we, well, we couldn't see anyone. We knew you were listening and it meant a lot to us. It helped us play for you because now you'd be listening. So uh, while we, we really wanna encourage people to come back to the home, eat now and when it's, and they'll see how safe it is because we're having people sit socially distanced and the hall is cleaned and everyone who comes in is vaccinated so it's completely safe and it's so good to be with people um, so i will say first and foremost you know partly our job as an orchestra is to bring people together physically together you know in the same room listening together but on the other hand we know there are people who can't always get to the concert so we are going to come up with a way of continuing in some shape um, streamed concerts for people who, who simply can't get, get to the hall. That's really wonderful to know. Um, so that actually kind of leads into the next question. What is the future of innovative programming such as multimedia presentations? Well, we're going to continue that. I mean, we've already had experimented with uh, some things like um, opera with uh, since we can't, we don't have a big enough stage to have a lot of room for for props and, and you know and and, see, and set changes, to do it with lights, to do it with projection of lights, so that we're, we're going to do a magic flute, Mozart magic flute in January, and we're going to do that, uh, set the scene with lights that will be projected on the back back wall of Klein Hands. So. Um, that will be something, and we've done, we, and we'll continue to do things with the Irish Classical Theatre. Those, those have been very, very much fun for us. Um, we'll do things with some visual projections, uh, and, and you know, it's, it's made us more creative. It really has, because 
once we realize that we could use video, um, we can use it to enhance what we're doing or to amplify what we're doing. I might, you know, one of the ideas I have is to have videos of our musicians talking about themselves, uh, maybe in the lobby, so people can hear our musicians just talking to them about how they learned to play the viola or why they chose the oboe. Um, and that's available, so we'll have some video, a video library. We've already amassed this incredible video library for children of uh, all kinds of things about instruments and how to learn to play these instruments and uh, even things in Spanish, you know, like Peter and the Wolf in Spanish, where people uh, can hear that in their native language. So it's, um, it's going to be a very useful tool for us. Well, Joanne, I think we're very lucky to have you because I know that you're very innovative and have been rewarded for that in the past. So all of these ideas sound fabulous. Well, I get a lot of help from many, many people. Our audience, I mean, I've got lots of ideas from our audience um, and our musicians too. I mean, they sometimes find pieces or they'll tell me about a soloist who's really special or about a, a different way of, of uh, doing a concert. and. You know, we've got some new ideas coming up for next year, which I hope people will like. If they come to the if they come to the to Klein Hands in here, we have this idea that after the concert, we'd invite them to stay, if they wanted to, and ask a little panel of musicians questions. And our musicians will come to the front of the stage and sort of be like, "Okay, what did you think? What did you like? What was your favorite part? You know, that kind of thing." And the audience could ask them. That, that looked very difficult. How difficult was that section? And get answers from, um, um, you know, get answers from from uh, the audience. So, and the musicians, I mean, it, I think it would be a, a fun way to, to do that. And we'll have more musicians in our pre-concert talks so that they can they can share with, with the audience their their feelings. You know, the, our, our musicians are really charming and very, um, very communicative people so I and they love they love the, the, their audience so we want to encourage that communication definitely and only deepen that connection that everybody's feeling with each other exactly exactly Katie thank you mm -hmm. uh, the next thing I'm seeing is I always enjoy going to the Philharmonic one of my all-time favorites was the Yo-Yo Ma concert um, what are your rec recollections of having him here? Yo-Yo is an amazing individual. First of all, I mean, we know he's a great cellist. He is a great cellist, uh, but he's a great human being. And, and I, I say that, that he's like a person that I think is the, the greatest soul that I've ever met. He is um, just always so interested in everyone, sincerely interested in people, happy to play music, for him, playing music is like the greatest joy of his life. And I always tell him, you know, sometimes he does the Dvorak cello concerto with me. And that's, he's probably played that thousands of times. And I said, Yo-Yo, you know, you sit there and you play this piece like you just discovered it and are in love with it. He said, but I am. <laughs> he's, the, he's the most beautiful person. And he's never nervous backstage. You know, sometimes, well, sometimes I'm a little nervous or our guest artist is nervous. Yo-Yo is not nervous at all. He's running around talking to everyone, smiling and laughing. And then he walks out on the stage. So we have to bring him back soon. I'm sure he'll come back soon. He's, um, he's a really very special uh, individual, a very caring, very beautiful spirit, truly a beautiful spirit. So, so he's long overdue to come back. I'll try and keep trying. <laughs> That sounds like a person that you would always just look forward to look to work. Absolutely. With. Absolutely. He is a superstar. <laughs> so that person actually had a second part of their question yeah. too. Uh, Jonathan Antoine, apologies if I'm, I'm mispronouncing that, is a rising tenor from England. What would the process be to possibly get him to Buffalo? I'll look into him. Right now, we've made a decision not to have people come from overseas for next season, just because we don't know about travel visas and will people have to quarantine. This year, of course, we couldn't have anyone come from overseas. Uh, and we thought we'd be very cautious about next year, just in case travel is still difficult. So, but starting in 22, 23, we're going to be able to bring international people over. So I'll look into, I'll look into him. I have not heard him and, I, and I'm very intrigued, so. So any any other ideas, I welcome them. That's all.
Awesome, thanks, Joanne. Uh, next, we're wondering uh, when will the classical guitar competition resume? You know, we we don't know. We th almost thought we could do it this year. We almost thought we could do it this June, but the problem was again with traveling because it might be a surprise to people, but most of our most of our candidates, our competitors, come from not the United States, but all over the world. They come from Russia, they come from China, they come from Taiwan, uh, Thailand, all over South America. Um, so we knew it would be too hard for them to travel and in some cases impossible for them to travel. So at the last moment we thought, okay, we've got to wait another year. So that's what we're hoping. Okay. This next person says, You've experienced many concert halls during your career. How does Kleinhans stand out or is it different from others? Kleinhans is unique. I have to say Kleinhans is, is, is a, a concert hall unlike uh, any others. There are occasionally a concert hall when I'm in Sweden or, or um, mostly in Sweden, I'll see a concert hall that reminds me a little bit of Kleinhans, remembering that the architects were from Finland. So there's that feeling of wood and space, which we prize so much. But in the United States, Kleinhans is truly unique. And um, we're so lucky. I mean, the hall was built in 1940. Um, and at that time, the design of Kleinhans was shockingly modern because concert halls more, more often look like temples, you know, like Greek temples with columns and very, you know, very sort of, uh, you know, uh, imposing looking. And, and our board at that time decided that they were going to go with this great architect team, Elio and Eros Salonen, a father and son team from Finland, uh, who had already done a lot of work in the United States, great work. So, um, and, the Serenans actually thought about the concert hall as a musical instrument. They said they, they tried to model it on a violin so that when you go in the hall, you can imagine that the walls you're seeing are actually the, the walls of a little of a violin and you're sitting inside. That's what they were thinking, as if people could shrink themselves, go in the middle of a violin and hear music that way. And that's why we have such superb acoustics, because that's what they were thinking of. Kleinhans is, is truly an amazing hall. It's easy to play in it. The musicians and I feel that our sound resonates, but we also feel very close to the audience. And it's it's just, there's very good karma on that stage. Uh, and from Rachmaninoff, Rachmaninoff came in that first season, um, very near the end of his life, he came to play a, a recital, piano recital, and he said, this is a spectacular acoustic. And we're very lucky because of that. I mean, we're just very lucky that the Serenans imagined this instrument and the whole really is an instrument. So, but it's just, there's something very good about Kleinhans. It's comfortable. You feel like you're right in the middle of the music and we feel so close to the audience. We've played in, in Carnegie too. Carnegie was also a very beautiful acoustic. I think less comfortable than Kleinhans. If anyone's ever sat in the Carnegie balcony, if anyone was ever brave enough to go up and sit in the Carnegie balcony, which is very scary because it's so steep, it's very frightening. Um, it may not be as comfortable as Kleinhans, but it is a, certainly a superb hall. And um, those would be two of my favorites. I mean, um, Kleinhans and Carnegie. Wow, that's really neat. Thank you for explaining the design of Kleinhans like that. That was such a great visual. Yeah, and people should think about that when they go in. I mean, that it's really a, a musical instrument and that's how they were thinking about it. And of course, you know, it's very plain and I think that uh, uh, very simple because that adds to its acoustical properties. It can reflect off this wood. It doesn't have lots of hanging curtains and beautiful draperies and all kinds of things on the wall. No, it's just a pure instrument. All these things that you just go and sit down and don't really even pay attention to that's yeah. enhancing your experience. Well, that's it. It doesn't matter as long as you have a good experience. That's the main thing. Um, we have uh, the next question is, do you have a certain pre-concert routine? Maybe sit down, make a cup of tea or wear a lucky pair of socks? <laughs> Well, I do have a concert routine. You know, we always do our rehearsal in the morning. Like if we have a Saturday night concert, we'll do our rehearsal on Saturday morning. And then I go home and have a big lunch. 
because I don't like to eat before the concert. So I figured I'll have a big lunch and I always take a nap um, around 3.30 or so. I take a nap and try and just, you know, make the room as dark as I can, sleep for 40 minutes or an hour at the most. And then I start getting ready. And, um, and once I start getting ready for the concert, I don't feel hungry anymore. So I'm not hungry for dinner. I just, because when you start to get a, an adrenaline rush, which I think all of us get, we start to get that feeling of adrenaline because we know we're about to give a concert. Uh, you don't feel so hungry anymore. So um, I plan to get to the hall early. And one of the things that helps relax me, and I'm going to continue this next year, is that I always do a pre-concert talk to the audience. And I can actually see them then because otherwise my back is to them. So I walk out on stage and there's, you know, 100 people there maybe wanting to know about, okay, what's the music going to be like? And I love telling them about the music and I love seeing them. And I, I know that if I can give them some clues about the music or some things to listen for, like open a window that this is about this and this is why he wrote that and um, that they'll enjoy it more. So I always do that. Um, and then I try and I try and stay quiet for half an hour in between and then get ready to, to walk out on stage. And it's it's kind of a glorious feeling because backstage is really dark. They keep backstage really dark. And at the moment when the concert begins, they open up the um, door and this the stage is glowing. It looks golden because all of the light that's on it and this is glow, go, glowing golden stage and all the musicians are there. And, and we get started. And there's a real buzz. I mean, we're feeling very charged, maybe a little nervous, but mostly very excited to play. And then what is that like for you to unwind after a concert? You know, it takes a long time, Katie. It really does because you're, you're just so filled with, uh, I guess it's adrenaline, but it's also endorphins, whatever. You know, I wish I knew more about the science of it but it's all of those things in your brain that make you feel good, you know? And music is one of the few things that we experience as human beings that lights up our entire brain. Usually like reading only lights up one part and, you know, talking only lights up one part, but music lights up your entire brain. So you're sort of flooded with endorphins and feel good, you know, chemicals. And, um, and it takes me a long time, but you know, for all the musicians as well, and usually our guest artist, maybe a violinist or a pianist, they're feeling the same way. And they probably didn't eat either before. Most of them don't eat, again, for the same reason, because when you have adrenaline, you don't feel like eating really. Um, but they're starving after the concert. You're absolutely starving. So of course they can't wait to go out. We always take them out to have some dinner. Um, and so we wind up eating dinner at like 11 o'clock or 11.30, which is terrible, but, but it's celebratory too. And it helps them relax, you know, to, and, and celebrate the concert. So um, it, it's a nice, it's a nice time for our guest artists to be with me and some of the musicians and celebrate. That has to be really neat. You, you sit, you're in it, you go, you celebrate, you have some good food and you just wind down and have that connection. That's right. That's right. That's our, that's our, that's our plan. What we usually do. Good. Uh, next question here is how often do you use your personal individual talents to improvise on a piece? Oh, we very rarely improvise. We very rarely improvise because for most of us, um, uh, most of the musicians, because remember the musicians are actually playing, um, they have to play exactly what's printed. And, and sometimes it's incredibly difficult, but they have to play it exactly as written. Um, it's the musicians, it's really talented musician, like jazz musicians or musicians from earlier time, like in box time, who would be able to make up music on the spot. Our musicians, while some of them can do it, most of them are, are trained to a very, very high level of reproducing what they see. So there's not that much improvisation. Occasionally a new piece of music will ask us for a moment or two to just make up something and we do it, but that's very rare. Mostly, uh, uh, mostly they're playing whatever, whatever they see in front of them, no matter how difficult it is, they learn. And I would imagine that's important. So they're not throwing off anybody around them. That's right. Because in our rehearsals, we get used to hearing each other exactly what the other person is doing so we can be together. So um, when they have some solo, they have a little bit of flexibility because if they're by themselves, 
but otherwise they are trying really hard to play completely together you know like as if they were a chamber music group of a hundred people and that's what they're that's what we're aiming for that everyone is completely together interesting and the next thing i'm seeing is how or have you or are you interested in incorporating period instruments into performances you know i i used to play and and i miss it i, I love playing the renaissance lute and i played in a renaissance band so I am a great lover of Renaissance music or early instruments, but it's, we really can't fit them into our modern instrument orchestra. So uh, for us to play Renaissance music, um, we probably should bring a Renaissance group who come with, uh, you know, viols and lutes and uh, shawms and and the and the authentic renaissance instruments which are great which are great but but the instruments that all of the musicians are playing on the stage are really 20th century instruments and they they're made slightly differently and they're made to, they're made to be louder because they need they need more projection for big halls and uh, uh, so our repertoire really ranges from let's say vivaldi in the early 18th century up through today um, but anything before that really needs um, specific instruments to play. Thank you for explaining that. That makes a lot of sense now. Um, the next question I'm seeing is, can you talk about your experience breaking into a predominantly male field? Well, I have to say I was probably the most naive child because when I decided I wanted to be a conductor you know I mean there I was at 10 or 11 or something saying I just started studying I was buying scores I was buying recordings I was constantly listening to orchestra music and watching orchestra uh, going to as many concerts as my parents would you know were going to and uh, I never really made the connection that there weren't women that I saw I just happened to see men conducting and it didn't it didn't strike me that you had to be a man because I, I was intent on doing the same thing. And it was only when I went to college, when I went to the Manus Conservatory, that they told me, well, at this point, there are very few, if any, women who are successful as orchestra conductors. So we want to tell you that, you know, and we want to see if you want to change your mind in any way. I said, no, please, I, I just, I don't want to change my mind. And it wasn't really, you know, people say sometimes, oh, you're a pioneer. I said, no, please don't give me credit for that because I did it out of ignorance. I just loved, I love the orchestra. I fell in love with the orchestra. I fell in love with Beethoven symphonies. I had to be a conductor, but I wasn't trying to be a pioneer. So it took me by surprise when, when I heard that. But, you know, at the age of 18, I thought, well, why not? You know, let me, let me try it. And I will always be grateful both to Manus and to Juilliard for, for letting me study there because without that I wouldn't have been able to pursue a career but they were they were willing to to do something that was very unusual at that time to train a woman to be an orchestral conductor and I think it's interesting what you said that they mentioned it to you but they didn't it just sounds like didn't try to dissuade you from it they just wanted you to be aware they want me to think about it and know that it might be difficult you know and I do tell young people the same thing you know when they say I'd like to be a, a musician um, and I say, well, just remember, it's not an easy pathway, you know, because it's not, it's, it, it requires a lot of entrepreneurial thinking. It requires a lot of practicing your entire life. Just be sure that's what you want. When I talk to young musicians, and almost always they say, yes, that's what I want. So then, you know, okay, they have to be a musician. So, but no, I think both schools are very kind about it and very, um, uh, while there probably was still some skepticism about whether a woman could have a career as a conductor, um, they they allowed me to study and, and it made an enormous difference, of course. And and I think even when I came to Buffalo, um, it was incredibly forward thinking of the of the board to hire a woman. Of course, there hadn't been a woman as music director of the Buffalo Philharmonic. They had those wonderful luminaries uh, like Joseph Cripps and and William Steinberg and. Uh, and Michael Tilson Thomas and Lucas Foss of the past, um, but they were very open-minded about it, and I, and I feel very fortunate to have you know been given sort of the stewardship of this fantastic orchestra for these years. Well, we're very lucky to have you. Well, I, I'm really the lucky one, Katie. Thank you.
You're welcome. Uh, this question here is when you read a score for the first time, can you hear the music? When the score is is not atonal and not completely uh, avant garde, yes. But you know, then we get into sometimes the most uh, strange music, and we don't play much of that. But sometimes that that takes a, a little while to work out. But um, but yes, because that's that's what I have been trained to do: to be able to read a score and to be able to, and then to know how to make that score work, how how to balance instruments how to phrase things, how to pace things. Um, that's, that's really the training of a conductor. Well, and, and actually, since you mentioned that, um, someone's wondering if you can speak a little bit more to your training to learn the skill of conducting. Yeah, yes, you know, I always say that conducting is one of the strangest jobs anyone could have because in a way, there you are in the middle of the musicians, as I mentioned before, and you are the only one not making a sound. This is in the concerts, of course, in the orchestra, in the rehearsals, you're talking a lot, but you're not making a sound. And the musicians are, are making all the music come to life, yet they need you there. They're focused on you and they're focused on what you're doing with your gestures, with your face, with your body language. You're sending them signals and they're sending signals back to you, unspoken, you know, so you're really, you're really communicating very, very intensely with each other. But um, the training for conductors that we have to realize that we're about to play a piece that could be, in a case of a Mahler symphony, 90 minutes long. And we have to make that make sense. It's like if, if you were reading a story to someone, you would have to know how to pace that story. You would have to know where the high points were, where it needed to get agitated, where it could calm down. You would need to know all of that. And then and you're doing that as the conductor. You're, you're creating the architecture for that long story without words. So it's like architecture in music um, and you are you're you're shaping that. So, so you learn how to do that through gestures. You learn you study a lot about the music. You study a lot about what the composer was thinking uh, when he most of the time that we studied you know traditional music was writing this. Uh, what were they trying to say? What did Beethoven want? What would Beethoven have wanted this to sound like? So we try and be as close to the score as possible, and then it's our job to communicate that to the orchestra. Um, and then to show them in gestures how to play. So um, uh, it's, it's a very strange way of, of doing things, but frankly, as I mentioned this before too, that when the Buffalo Philharmonic is playing full tilt on the stage, not everyone can hear anything but themselves. I mean, for instance, once the trombones start playing, they really can't hear the string section at all. So they need someone that they can say, okay, you know, Joanna's showing us what to do. We'll, we'll follow that tempo. We'll follow that transition. We'll slow down here because that's what she's doing. Because they can't, uh, they can't, um, they can't take it by listening. You know, when we have a string quartet, I mean, if you went to a string quartet concert, there are four people sitting so close together, seeing and hearing each other, they would not need a conductor. But as the orchestra got bigger and bigger and bigger, the conductor had to not only make sure everyone stayed together, but that everyone had a unified idea about how we were approaching the piece of music. So um, that that's something. But I, I, I'll tell you, when I talk, talk to this person too, we learn what conducting is every day of our lives. I mean, we never we never get to the end and say, now I know how to conduct. No, you're constantly you're constantly learning. You're constantly learning from the musicians. If they are sounding beautiful, you know that your gestures are helping that. If they're having trouble, you know that you're doing something that's making it a little uncomfortable for them. And all of that you have to perceive um, without talking, you know, just from listening. Wow, you are conducting so many different things in that moment. It, a lot is going on. Yes, a lot is going on. And of course, you know, it 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 helps to have like fantastic players around you. <laughs> it's great. But you know, I will tell you, it's sort of the same thing. When I go oh, in the summer, I work with kids a lot, and I'm maybe working with high school kids, and it doesn't sound like the Buffalo Philharmonic. That's for sure. But yet, their joy in the music and their approach to it and their love of it is is similar you know that they're they're loving this music and they're playing with each other and and uh, and it's very valid to see that happen too and 
we've got about 10 minutes left here and I, I have a lot of questions so i'm gonna get through what we can yeah, just whatever we get through yes absolutely you mentioned the kids enjoying playing together one person is wondering if there's a camaraderie amongst everybody in the orchestra maybe different different units oh there is there is. it's actually it's like a family now i'm gonna you know, sometimes people tease me when I say that about the orchestra, the musician says, well, we're a little dysfunctional sometimes, but I think they're really teasing about that because it is a family. We see each other every day, except for Monday. I mean, they're always together. So not only do they know uh, how people play, they know about their children. They know about the troubles of their life. They know about uh, the happy things that happen, you know, when someone has a new child or, or, or uh, uh, buys a new car or whatever, or, or, uh, plays a solo recital and it's great. You know, they support each other in that way and they'll help. And if someone needs help in moving from an old apartment to a new apartment, they're there, you know, with their trucks or whatever they have and help. So it is a family and there's a lot of camaraderie. And of course there are special friendships too, you know, people who become very good friends in the orchestra. Um, but um, I think there's such a good camaraderie on, on stage. And, you know, it's it's unusual too, because our orchestra is made up of people of all different ages, as you can imagine. So so um, when, we, when we audition, uh, since we audition behind a screen, we don't see who we are hiring. It's completely blind. Some people know that it's completely blind so that nothing ever comes into it in terms of background or, or race or sex or age, nothing like that comes into it. We hire by number. And most of the time, the people who are winning our auditions are very young, like just out of school, just graduating from Juilliard, just graduating from Cleveland Institute of Music, wherever. And they're coming into the orchestra for the first time. And they may be, they may have the good fortune to sit next to someone who's been in our orchestra for 35 years and has played everything many times. And there's this person who's never played this Tchaikovsky symphony and they're terrified. And the person next to them tells them, now don't worry, here's the difficult spot. And they'll say, just be careful there. You know, this is gonna slow down here. This is gonna go really fast. So don't let it take you by surprise. So that kind of experience level where they can lean on the experienced player really creates this incredible multi-age bond so that everyone in the orchestra really works together. It's sort of ageless, the group. And uh, it's very, very nice chemistry. That's really wonderful to hear. And I'm sure it's comforting for those younger musicians knowing oh, very that they'll comforting. have that mentorship. Yes. yes, yes. Someone's wondering if there is an artist you would like to work with, but have not been able to connect with yet. Well, we've tried to get Yu Jia Wang here a few times and we're not gonna give up. Yu Jia Wang, the great pianist, um, she has not been able to come. I mean, it's, it, these people are booked so far in advance that sometimes by the time we know our dates, their dates are all taken up. But we do know that we have some incredible artists coming next year. And I know I'm not allowed to say because our marketing department has to tell it, has to say it, but we have some incredible artists coming that I, I, I'm very excited about working with, some for the first time, some that I have worked with before. So, uh, and we'll get Yuja Wine here too. But I welcome, I welcome from our audience any suggestions of artists, whether they're young artists or whether they're uh, really established artists that we haven't invited here yet, please let me know and we'll work on it. One of the greatest things I think in my life was working with Van Cliver uh, here. What a great pianist and a great gentleman and a great piece of our American history, you know, first American winner of the Tchaikovsky competition in, in Russia. So. Um, that there's some amazing things that have happened on that stage. Oh, oh that's so cool. Um, we have somebody who's wondering if the musicians have to audition each year and how the pandemic may have impacted um, people being able to play and come back. Well, they, they don't want, once they win their position, they have a two year probation process. Um, in which we just make sure everything is working and that they're fitting in and that they're, you know, understanding how seriously they have to be prepared. And then if they pass that probation, uh, they stay with us. They never have to audition again. They stay with us in the orchestra until it's time for them to retire. And that, that's usually yet yeah, their choice, you know, if it comes down to when they feel like, okay, it's been great, but now it's, you know, I'd like to spend more time with my grandchildren in many cases, or uh, we'd like to move to Florida or something like that. But um, 
but no, then they're in, so they don't have to audition. And uh, during the pandemic, we've had some challenges, um, but I think that it turned out to have a great silver lining. Uh, we can only have at the beginning when we came back together in September of 2020, um, we could only have 25 people on the stage because we had to allow a lot of space between people. And that was challenging at first, you know, to get used to being six feet or more apart from each other, um, to be wearing a mask. So, you know, you could hardly see your colleagues around you. But it was amazing that as we started to play that way, everyone was a bit nervous at first. It just felt okay. It felt fun. It felt wonderful. Like you could see people smiling, even though you could only see it in their eyes. You could see people smiling like, yes, this is what we know how to do. This is what we live for. This is what we wanted to do all our lives and we can do it. So, so it was great that we, we played together every week in the pandemic, every week, pops, concerts, classical concerts, um, youth concerts, that, but they were all filmed. We didn't have any audiences, but we played every week. And just being together made such a difference to us. And, and I think it's made us stronger and I think it's brought us closer together. So it's a silver lining in some ways. Absolutely. Oh, I'm sure everyone was just so excited to get back into playing and seeing everybody. It was it was a very good feeling. It was a very and no one got ill. I mean, we've we've had good health in our whole orchestra. We took we took very special precautions, and we are now with the audience too. So I did want to say to remind people that we are giving concerts this weekend and the next three weekends. There are concerts at Klein Hands at Klein Hands. It's not going to be for a big audience, but if you want to come, just call the office. And if you're a subscriber, it's free. You just come to the concert, and and it's it's a very good feeling. So we would welcome that. Definitely. Uh, one more question and then we'll let you get back to what you need to do, Joanne. Um, this one person's just wondering, how did the musicians near the percussion and brass protect their hearing? Oh, that's a very sensitive question. A lot of our musicians wear earplugs when they need to. Now you may, if you look at them very carefully, you will see them take them in and out. And so they remember like, oh no, there's gonna be that giant symphony, symphony thump right there. Okay, I'll put my earplug uh, ear in and then they'll take it out. They, they generally don't like to wear earplugs because it diminishes the color of the sound, as you can imagine, you know, it cuts out a lot of the color and the beauty of the sound. But if they know something is gonna be very loud, they'll put the earplug in. And occasionally you might see on our stage plexiglass. If, it's, if a brass section, if we're playing a piece where the brass is being asked, the composer says, play as loud as possible in the brass. Um, the people in front of the brass, we try and protect them with some plexiglass so that that sound doesn't come right at the back of their heads. So so um, it, 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 that's one of the dangers of playing in an orchestra, but thank you for that question. We try and, we try and keep everybody safe. That's really wonderful. We would have never known because you couldn't see the plexiglass. Wow. Oh yeah, that's true, it's clear, so it's not so bad. <laughs> Well, Joanne, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us here today. Well, Katie, it was a delight to have this conversation. Thank you. You made it so much fun. And I want to thank all the people. I wish I could see your faces, but but I know I will see you soon. And thank you for caring about the Buffalo Philharmonic. The musicians miss you and they love you. So we hope to see you very soon. And you too, Katie, come and be with us. I would love that. All right. Bye, everyone. Take care.